Thank you, Greg. Can y'all hear me okay? Some years ago, I was invited to speak at a conference for Veterans Day. And during the course of that conference, I made the comment that because I've been plagued by knee problems all of my life, I was never able to get into the military. And during the course of my, uh, my comments, I made the point that I am jealous of the relationship that our veterans have with this nation. And I've, I'm a product of the Vietnam era. I never served at that particular war, obviously, because of my age and because of my situation with the military. And as I got older, I began to realize that there were other ways for me to serve my nation. And that's one of the reasons that I'm in talk radio, but it's also one of the reasons that I'm with you here today. Because I think there's a real fundamental breakdown in what people think they understand about the Constitution and the reality of the Constitution. And that's what we're gonna discuss here today. And I'm gonna tell you that I've got about 30 minutes or so, and I've got about seven and a half hours of material. So I'm gonna have to kind of edit on the fly here just a bit. And as you're well aware, I know a lot of you guys have heard Rabbi Walker speak in the past. You've probably never heard me speak. This is something that we're going to do on an ongoing basis because I am really excited about the things that I get to share with you today and hopefully what you're going to learn today. And some of it you're going to already know. A lot of it might be brand new. But what we're going to do is we're going to very quickly cover the 28 points that the Founding Fathers based the Constitution on when they brought it to life in 1787. What a lot of people don't seem to understand about the Constitution, however, is that in the time it was written, the Founding Fathers knew that they were creating a miraculous document, and they did not take that lightly. Ironically enough, many of the people that were the, the, uh, the colonists at the time also knew it, and they appreciated the effort of the Founding Fathers. They understood the need of what was taking place. They understood the fact that they were being oppressed from King George in England. But the Constitution has a storied past that's just absolutely amazing to me. Now, some years ago, I wrote a book, or read a book, rather, called The 5,000-Year Leap. And I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. But essentially what it boils down to is that in the last 229, 230 years or so of this nation's history, more accomplishments have been made under the Constitution than in the previous 4,800 years of all human existence, at least going back to the earliest civilizations that had the historical underpinnings that we know of, in other words. And this is predicated on the protections that are afforded to us in the Constitution. And the, frown, the founders knew this because you know what else they knew? They were all pretty much historians. We also often talk about how they were Christians or some of them were deists or whatever the case may be. In the case of people like Thomas Paine, he was even an atheist. But the point is they all had a religious position. They all studied history as well. And that's one of the things that I think is oftentimes lost because the Founding Fathers knew that the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the, the Greeks, and the Persians all had these great cultures that preceded America, and every one of them crumbled under the weight of famine. And it's really interesting to note that the United States of America, having only 5% of the world's total population, has created more wealth in the history of the world than every other nation combined. And this is because they understood the miraculous nature of what they were doing. And they did not take it lightly at all. Now, that brings us to probably the key focal point that I want to get to today. And it is one of the 28 tenets that they picked out. Because they were very adamant about the fact that the United States of America and the Constitution that would guide it, Benjamin Franklin said this, Jefferson said it, even Thomas Paine said it, that the Constitution was written for a moral people. Now, before people start looking at me and say, well, we understand that. They weren't just talking about things like promiscuity. In the minds of the founding fathers, morality had to do with things like service, contribution. There wasn't so much taxation and things like that. The whole idea was that you guys are the country and that the politicians go to represent you. And they would not recognize this country today in the, the framework that they understood it. Because the entire Constitution is based upon something that they consider to be timeless. And that simply is human law. Believe it or not, 
Much of it is actually authored under the, the writings of the Roman emperor Cicero, who believed that all rights are from God, that all rights are unalienable rights from God. There are things in the 28 points that fascinate me that they sought after that even they didn't know at the time. Because in the Constitutional Convention, which by the way, before we whitewash it, was a rather, let's just say, contemptuous and at times frisky event. These guys put together this particular document knowing all too well that it would have to guide humanity for many years. And there was a lot of mistakes made along the way because one society after society after culture after culture perished under the weight of famine. They knew it. And then the very first settlement of England, Jamestown in 1607, when King James sent the settlement here to, to establish a brand new foothold in what was uh, then, now, Virginia. And it was a, a very harsh, very desperate, very desolate time in our nation's history. And for 180 years, this, what would become this nation, foundered based upon what happened in Jamestown. Of the 9,000 original settlers, only 1,000 of them survived. But what's interesting that most people don't realize is, under the weight of famine and pestilence and disease, I mean, they're medicines, were these noxious concoctions that were deadly. But under the weight of that, the settlers in Jamestown actually put together the very first legislative body in all of U.S. history, or what was then just American history. And it's very interesting to note that the founding fathers, which by the way, let me stop here just for a second. The whole pretense of my program, my radio show, is I believe that everything that troubles this nation today, the answer to it can be found in history. Because George Santayana said, and you've heard it before, those that condemn the past, or forget the past, or contend to repeat it, it's very much the same thing. We're repeating the same things over and over and over again. So looking back to Jamestown and all the things they went through, these guys understood if they were going to survive, they were going to have to introduce some form of free market economics. The founding fathers looked to the ancient Romes, Romans, they looked to what happened in Jamestown to put together this document that they felt like was God-inspired and that they knew was God-inspired. There are a lot of people that spend a lot of time talking about whether or not the Founding Fathers were in fact Christian. And of course, many of them were. But the simple reality of it is, is that they all had a belief in a higher divine creator. You've heard the terms are unalienable rights and that everything sprung from that. And the reason they came to that conclusion was their views on their three laws. One of them was tyrannical law. The other one was fascism. They had communism on the left and fascism on the hard right. And they sought something in the middle of what they called people's law. And one of the 28 points that I'm so fascinated about is that they had to have a constitution that would protect all humanity from the frailties of man. Now, we're going to break these down here in just a second in the limited time that we have together, but I want to stop right now and point out something to you. I, I'm a Christian. And I'll tell you, I've struggled with my Christianity over the years. I've heard many of you say this, you know, this morning, uh, you were raised a Catholic or a Baptist. I was born a, a Catholic. My parents raised me as a Catholic. When I was 13 years old, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior as a Baptist. I got married in the Presbyterian Church and then sounds, served as the administrative council leader in the Methodist Church. And now I go to a non-denominational church in Hoover. I don't care. I just want in. But the reason I bring that up to you is I oftentimes see people that will go to a service and they will worship and they'll sing and they'll praise and they'll shake hands and they tithe and they do their things and then they walk out the door and they leave it all behind. And they start to treat the sanctuary as though it's a classroom. We can't afford to do that in our faith and we certainly can't afford to do that with the future of this nation. So please, please understand that you are not going to leave here today a constitutional scholar any more than I am one. 
but I do want you to leave here as a constitutional student and make certain that you learn these tenets and that you profess these tenets and that you share them with every single person that you come in, in contact with because I'm going to say something to you now real rude and I, I beg your forgiveness. I'm 55 years old. It will be in June. And I'm one of the younger people in the room. We're losing an entire generation to the idiocracy of the left because they don't understand the tenets of freedom. And what fascinates me about liberals is they work so hard to lobby for things that are in direct opposition to their own best interest. And I get sick and tired as a conservative talk radio host of having to go to work every single day to defend them from their own ignorance. But I do it gladly. But that's because they don't understand the things that are contained in there because government doesn't have the answer. The founding fathers knew. The founding fathers wanted a strong government. They just didn't want a big government. Their, their main objective was protecting the market flow between the economies of the individual colonies and protecting the borders. Yep, they had that discussion even then. But they understood the lessons that were learned in Jamestown that when a, when a, when a tyrannical, dictatorial type of government was allowed to prevail, that in fact, people starved to death. They came up with 28 different points, and I'm going to get through them very quickly. And these are some of the things, and by the way, this is not my opinion. This is actually what they wrote. And I want to examine some of them and what they meant, because there's a couple in here that they didn't even know what they were saying at the time they wrote them, which I find fascinating. And that just speaks to the brilliance of the framers. And again, it was a very contemptuous, because at one point in time, there was actually 100 of these precepts, and they whittled it down, and they whittled it down, and they whittled it down. For example, number one, the only reliable basis for sound government and human relations is natural law. And that's a teaching from, the, uh, from, the, from um, uh, Cicero in Rome. And what that meant by that was is that we have got to live as a free people because all of our law comes from Jesus Christ, from God, from the Holy Father, from what they just commonly refer to as a creator. And when you replace, and this is just, by the way, the agenda of the left is to replace the church with government. That is, the, and that's not nefarious, folks. This is not something where I'm just saying, oh, and by the way, let me stop here as well. Barack Obama ain't the problem. He's a symptom of the problem. He's a symptom because I will tell you that a lot of the stuff that I got into in my research goes back to 1977 when they started talking about how the Constitution was being dismantled. They're not going to fix it in D.C. because they have no desire to fix it in D.C. because they don't adhere to natural law as we understand it because they want it to be government-inspired law. And I'm not talking about just rules and regulations. They want the church out of the way. And if you doubt that for a single moment, hopefully I'll change your mind before I, my time is done here today. Number two, a free people cannot survive under a Republican constitution unless they remain morally strong. By the way, self-government was commonly referred to at that time as Republican government. Morally strong. Yes, it to a degree had to do with the structure of the family, which by the way is also one of the 28 tenets, but it also has to do with the morality of service, the morality of employment, the reality of not taking from the system to the detriment of those that pay into the system. When they spoke of a moral and virtuous culture, they were speaking of nationalistic virtue, putting country first. I'm sick and tired of hearing people talking about the rights and privileges of being an American. I'd much rather talk about the responsibilities of being a citizen because those are the things that are lost on the young people of this country. By the way, disclaimer, I got three of them. I got a 23-year-old going all the way down to an 18-year-old. I am very fortunate to say that my 23-year-old is one more raging conservative. I am delighted that she has gone down that track, but then again, look who she's got for a dad. But too many people out there don't understand this. And the Founding Fathers knew. They talked amongst themselves about it. They referenced it many times in the past about it. For example, James Mason said, or Madison said, is, is there no virtue among us? 
If there be not, we are a wretched situation. No theoretical checks, no form of government can render us secure. To suppose that any form of government will secure liberty or happiness without any virtue in the people is a false idea. If there be sufficient virtue and intelligence in the community, it will be exercised in the selection of these men so that we do not depend upon their virtue but put confidence in our rulers and the people who choose virtuous leaders. I've got pages of this kind of stuff because it is a matter of the morality of the nation. The morality that's not going to give us rampant divorce, out of wedlock childbirth, violence in our streets, movements that are antithetical to the best interest of this nation. I'm not pointing fingers at any one particular group, but the country literally is going exactly where they said it would go. And you know why? Their concern was this. As the country matured, as it aged, we would move further and further and further away from the struggles of this world. But do you realize that the Constitution gave us advances in medicine, science, technology, space, aerospace? It created international competition. Some of you might remember the space wars between the United States and the USSR. It created this entire climate world over. But as, as the Constitution's value has been diminished, you've seen more and more and more strife throughout the course of the world. And this is one of the things that the millennials can't quite seem to get their heads around because they don't understand that as the morality of the nation has suffered, so has their future. Number three, the most promising method of securing a virtuous and morally stable people is to elect virtuous leaders. And again, they weren't so speaking about just devout Christians. They were speaking about leaders that had national virtue that would do the right things for the people all the time. They spoke to minorities. They spoke to the virtue of dealing with minorities very fairly. And all of this went down in 1787 over the course of several days as they nailed the Constitution together. The most uh, promising method, again, of securing these leaders was for us to pay attention to what they thought, they believed. And no, I'll tell you, and I'm not going to tell you who I'm voting for in this upcoming election because I haven't decided. But some candidate saying two Corinthians does not necessarily an atheist make. And so we've got to look at there, because I'm going to tell you something. And again, one of the reasons I'm on so late at night is because I tend to say stuff that can be offensive. But that's okay. I'm not as concerned about the Christianity and the faith of my president as much as I am a president that will allow me to have that faith in my own home. I want a president that's going to do what the Constitution calls him to do. Leave me alone and let me guide my family. We've had Christian presidents in this country before. It hasn't gone well. That's not to say I don't want one, but my main concern, because see, in my mind, my little house with my three kids in it, that's like a microchurch. And the founders knew that. They wanted God in every home. They wanted it in the street corners. They just didn't want government speaking to it. But their major concern was that we protect the sanctity of our ability to congregate and to gather and to do just what we're doing here today. Number five, without religion, the government of a free people cannot be maintained. They mandated that, that religion be taught in our schools. Not necessarily the Christian faith, not any one denomination, but that there was five tenets that they identified in religion, one, of course, being a supreme being, natural law, et cetera. And they wanted these things taught in the schools, and they mandated that these things be taught in the schools. All things were created by God, therefore upon him all mankind are equally dependent to him and equally responsible. And then probably one of my favorite, numbers, this is number seven, all men are created equal. This was a slave-holding period of time. That's a rather very stern position for them to take. They said it before they even knew what they were saying. This was a prime example of God blessing them when they came up with the idea that all men 
are created equal. Now understand that slavery during the colonial period in the Northeast looked different than it did in the Deep South 100 years later. It was a matter of indentured servitude. We can do this for hours if y'all want to have this debate. I love to do it. The point is this, that they understood when they wrote that clause as one of their tenants that they were going to have to deal with the issue of enslaving other human beings. And they began to codify that thought during this convention. I know Abraham Lincoln emancipated the slaves, and I'm, we can have a Lincoln debate later, but the founding fathers were the ones that started the ball rolling because as they put together the framework of their constitution and that there's natural law and unalienable rights, then they must apply to everyone. And it's fascinating to see the way they drew that conclusion. Because you had Irish slaves at the time, you had African slaves, you had Asian slaves, and they came to the conclusion via the Constitution that if this was going to be God-inspired, if we were going to expect this to live in perpetuity, that all men must be accepted as being created equal, or God would not bless this nation. We can talk about the historical spikes, if you will, of this wheel and how it related to the mid-1800s, perhaps on a later date. But I'm fascinated by the fact that they drew that conclusion at such an early time. The proper role of government is to protect equal rights, not provide equal things. I think that one pretty much speaks for itself. You've got a candidate right now who's running on a platform, a free college education for everybody. Now, I'm not going to hold myself up as an example because I'm a real poor one, but I'm a high school dropout, and I don't learn nothing in school. I went and got my GED, then I went to UAB and studied there for a semester or two, joined a fraternity, worst decision I ever made, nothing against the Greek system. It wasn't for me because, quite frankly, I ended up, well, let's just say I spent more than one night with the county guys. <laughs> I, I'm, a, I, I'm a byproduct of some real, yeah, this is a church. I'm not going to share the story, but let's just say, let's just say they, you know, let's just say the man knew who I was, and let it go with that. Luckily, by the grace of God, I'm here today. But, but the point is, is that you know they, they understood these these real basic tenets of being created equal, but then being equally responsible, and then making absolutely certain that you're not entitled to anything, nothing. I loved it. I loved it when my 16-year-old son sat at the dinner table and railed against capitalism and the man and big corporations and all the things he railed against as he's reading stuff off his 500. no reason whatsoever to even have a debate upon the rights of men because guess what? They don't come from men. And these are the things. And by the way, this is also a witnessing tool, if you will, and making people understand that the Founding Fathers understood all too well that everything, that God is the spring well of everything. To protect man's rights, God has revealed certain principles of divine law. We're going to start cruising through these because a lot of these have to do with God. The majority of the people may pay, alter, or abolish a government which has become tyrannical. And this government has become very tyrannical. Now, what does abolishing it look like? Well, we can talk about things like conventions of the state, if you will, 
And again, that's a real deep, heavy thing. I'm not talking about bringing up arms. People call my program all the time at 8 o'clock at night, right about the time happy hour ends in most of the drinking establishments, to tell me how we need to go and, and take up arms against the federal government. No, that's not necessarily what the Founding Fathers were talking about, because there are provisions in the Constitution to the amendment process, the Convention of States, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that allows us to get people in and out of office more fluidly. These are the things that we need to employ much more quickly. And I'll tell you something else, too, and again, I don't want to be offensive to you. During the time of the, the colonist, it was not at all unusual for our pastors to take political positions. They did not necessarily advocate candidates, but I'm gonna tell you something else, and this is what really gets me going. This is where, luckily, the lavalier thing fell off, because I might have to throw a microphone here in a minute. 19% of all Americans consider themselves liberal. 39% of all Americans consider themselves Christian and or evangelical Christian. Tell me why we're talking about things like abortion and gay rights. I mean, really, why? No, I'm serious. Somebody tell me why. Because there's twice as many conser professed conservatives. My concern is that we got too many Christmas tree Christians out there. How in the world is a minority winning in a Christian country with a Christian document? All We don't have 51% of evangelicals claiming they do not vote. And that's a hard statistic. The God-given right to govern is vested in the sovereign authority of the entire people. Number 11, the majority of the people alter or abolish the government, again, which has become a tyrannical. The United States of America shall be a republic, because we're not a democracy. We're not, Germany, Nazi Germany was the democracy. There was five parties that helped get Hitler elected, and he was elected. We are a republic because we are need to be represented, and we are not being represented. Our interests here, particularly in the Deep South, are not being represented in all in Washington. The Constitution should be structured to permanently protect the people from the human frailties of their rulers. And this is kind of the impetus of why I wanted to be with you today, because these guys have frailties that we're seeing all too well that we are not exercising our constitutional right to remove them from office. Now, it's a beautiful Saturday in Alabama. The sun's out, the temperature's gonna warm up, and you're inside listening to a dissertation on the Constitution. And I appreciate it, don't get me wrong. Thank you very much for coming out today. But the reality of it is, if we don't take this stuff out into the streets and share it with our children, share it with our grandchildren, share it, walk up to the lady, you're gonna stop and get coffee or a water later. We, we know you are, the girl behind the counter. You know, ask her if she knows what one of her unalienable rights are and watch that blank stare. Because they don't know, because it's, it's going to be incumbent upon us. I've also worked the polls many times in my life. And it's typically older senior citizens that are manning the polls because the young people don't care because this stuff just sounds boring and heavy handed. We're going to have to make it a lot more interesting for them to get them to understand the need because they're not going to have a country to inherit in a very long time. I'm going to breeze through these and start skipping around because my time's getting tight. The founding fathers were very adamant about that the need for private property must remain secure. That is the basis of all liberty in this country. The highest level of prosperity occurs when there's a free market economy and a minimum of government regulations. You're probably familiar with the term GDP, or gross domestic product. That's the, the value of all goods and services and payrolls in any given year. This country, in terms of our companies, spends right at 8% of the entire economy's value just in compliance with regulations for the federal government. It's billions of dollars a year just to adhere to laws. There are doctors across this state who have staff members whose only job is to make sure that the Obamacare coding is done right. Because if you've got a blister on your right finger and a blister on your left, they are two different codes, and I'm not exaggerating. That is money coming out of your pocket that you're having to pay every single day for the simple matter that we are just, wow, are we ever overregulated? The government should be separated into three branches. You already know that. System of checks and balances, you already know that as well. 
The list goes on and on and on as to the things that the government was bad about us wanting to stay accomplished. Number 21, jumping around. A strong local government is a keystone to preserving human freedoms. That's a direct reference to states' rights and even county and municipal rights. The free people should be governed by law and not by the whims of men. A free people will not survive unless they stay strong. And ironically enough, they were speaking about physically strong. They were talking about being able to work the land, work the fields, hunt, fish, whatever had to be done. In addition to that, we're going to close this thing up with the burden of debt is as destructive to freedom as subjugation by conquest. They abhorred borrowing because we are a nation of debt. And by the way, our tax code, as it currently stands, actually encourages debt spending and borrowing. Now, this is some of the more you know, deep-weeded points that we can get to in terms of the Constitution. And I know that Rabbi Walker is going to come up here and share some of his, thought, his thoughts about the condition of the country. We're going to get into somewhat of a, um, uh, a biblical view of it as well. But I want you to understand something, and this is probably the single biggest thing that I can share with you today. We are, in fact, losing the tenets of the Constitution, and we're going to have to do something about it. You might be asking me, what can I do? Just do me a favor. When it's time to vote in, uh, uh, well, actually Tuesday will be the first one, but in November, pick up one person. Take one person to the polls with you. I've been a poll watcher and inspector for the state of Alabama in parts of town several of you might not feel comfortable going into, and people get bussed in from all corners of this state. Everybody has the right to vote. I have said this on the air a hundred times. I'm a right-wing Christian conservative, gun-toting loon Republican. I couldn't care less if I convert you from being a Democrat to a Republican. I couldn't care less if I convert you from being a liberal to a conservative. What I do care about is that you make that decision predicated on what you know to be the fact as opposed to what the media is shoving down your throat. Because do I have your permission to say kind of a dirty word in church? Too quick. The media is full of crap, and I'm in the media. <laughs> I am telling you folks in no uncertain terms, and I don't mean to be rude or caustic about it, I really don't, but the time for mincing words is over. The time for, for, for being a, a, apologetic is over because the Constitution was written for all peoples, but it has to be protected because our, it's, if the Constitution's lost, forget the Second Amendment. I understand gun rights. I've got guns. I've got plenty of guns. The state of Alabama, just yesterday, had the federal government to agree that if you've got a concealed weapons permit and you want to buy a gun, you no longer have to go through a background check in this state. I'm not a big fan of Luther Strange, but y'all can give him a hand, a round of applause for that. But the point still remains the same. I understand free speech. I understand Second Amendment rights. I understand the, you know, the rights of the unborn. I understand all the amendment rights and the Bill of Rights and all the other rights that we have in the Constitution. But you realize we lose the Constitution. Do you realize what really has happened? They have neutralized God. Because everything in the Constitution springs from him, and they said it. And every time there's an executive order, and Republicans do it too, every time there's an appointee or a recess appointee that we do not approve, and Republicans do it too, every time the value of the Constitution is diminished. And every time it happens, the place of the Lord, the Heavenly Father, the Divine Creator, is diminished. And we wonder why we have people shooting each other in streets, walking into post offices and into high schools and in our churches. I go to a church in Hoover. It's one of those really big, large churches with multiple, multiple campuses where there's lots of praising and stuff. Don't hold it against me. But I go to church, and there are seven police cars in the parking lot. When I was a youngster, you wouldn't see a cop anywhere near a church. That's not antithetical to cops. I'm just saying they were needed. 
Now you've got people, i got people telling me, we had a situational security conference here just a couple weeks ago in Birmingham, right down the road. I had three or four people walk up to me and say, I go to church every Sunday and I'm packing. I, look, I'm a Second Amendment guy, but I can't bring myself to carry a gun on, in a church. I just can't. Somehow it just seems to be a violation of my faith. I just can't get my head around it. But the point still remains the same. If we lose the Constitution as we understand it, that we lose the value of God in our lives, and then is it any wonder that we have violence and a sour economy and drug abuse and pornography addiction and alcohol addiction? Folks, that's real stuff, because let me tell you something, and I ain't proud to admit this, but I'm too old to run from it. I had a rough, nasty life that involved a lot of drugs, it involved a lot of alcohol, it involved a lot of different times in jail. No, I didn't shoot up anybody or burglarize anything. I actually had an article produced some years ago in For uh, Fortune magazine. I used to say all the time, I'm the only guy on radio who's been both in jail and in Fortune. But the point still remains is that our culture's going down there, and by the grace of God, I didn't find him. He found me. But unfortunately, it took some, uh, some prodding as well. The reality of it is, as, as this document, because I wasn't here to teach anything, I'm here to hopefully inspire you to understand that you've got to delve into it. Because the Constitution that you, Mindy, understand is not the Constitution that your grandkids understand because of that wonderful thing called the Internet and the full of crap media. Because these kids are overwhelmed, not with reality, not with truth, but with stimulus that has got them convinced that it's a privilege. It is a privilege of theirs that they have a right, an entitlement right in this country. They don't understand the sacrifices. When I made that comment five years ago that I was jealous of the relationship our veterans have with this country because I was never able to serve. And I see a man in front of me who was wheelchair bound, 100 years, almost 100 years old, with his blue cap on that showed what ship he served on, climb out of his wheelchair just to applaud that comment. It hit me right between the eyes. And those kids are not being taught these things today. And it's a harsh lesson for them to learn. But I will tell you this, in closing, if we don't at least make the attempt to save every soul we can and to convert every non-constitutional believer that we can, we will have some answering to do. Because this country has been blessed like no other blessing, like no other country has ever been blessed save that of perhaps the Israelis. But the point still remains the same, that this is our future, and it's our kids' future. And again, I implore you, don't just take what I have to say here today. Study it, learn it, research it. Not the words, but what they were thinking when they wrote it. Because believe it or not, they predicted exactly what's going on in this country today. And that's happened on our watch. There's time to turn it around, but that time is now. And one of the great ways that we can turn it around is by paying very, very, very careful attention to the words of Rabbi Eric Walker, who happens to be not only one of my best friends in the world, but a great mentor. And I gotta tell you how funny it is to tell my Baptist friends that I'm gonna go speak with the rabbi. <laughs> they don't understand, but I'm not gonna explain it to them because it's just too funny. Please welcome Rabbi Eric Walker. Thank you, Michael. It's an honor to be one of your closest friends and you are one to me. Thank you so much. Well, Thank you all for being here. Glad to uh, have you a part of this, uh, this wonderful event that uh, we all have um, looked forward to. And so I appreciate everything that you are doing to be here 
and uh, let me uh, cue up my notes so that I can All right, getting there. Uh, it's a beautiful day. Good to see all of you. Want to acknowledge our State House representative from the 48th District, uh, Jim Carnes. Do we have any other dignitaries in here that I haven't recognized? But uh, Jim is also the uh, co chair of the Alabama for Trump campaign. And so hopefully all of you will get an opportunity to speak with him and uh, ask him any questions that you may have that uh, you wanted to get uh, answered about this upcoming election. And so I want to thank Greg Davis for hosting this event. Uh, Michael, I certainly appreciate you sharing what you shared. I learned quite a bit. Uh, I'm now growing in my constitutional understanding and what our responsibilities are as believers. I want to assure you that I'm going to be brief no matter how long it takes. Okay. Uh, one of the responsibilities we have as Americans is to speak out and make our voice heard. We as a nation have lost our way. Over the past seven years, we've allowed political correctness to overshadow truth. And we've sat quietly by as our moral compass has been compromised. As believers, it's incumbent upon us to take a stand and take America back. Now, I'm not a politician, and I'm not aspiring to any office, but I am the voice of one who will not remain silent in the face of an enemy that would destroy the very fabric of our nation. And I'm going to ask you to join me in that fight. The balance of power within our borders has shifted to minority rule and more rights granted to those who violate the biblical mandates of right and wrong. I represent the smallest minority of people in the world, two-tenths of one percent of the population of America, the Jews. Prayer has been taken out of school. Murder of unborn babies has been legislated by our government. Marriage has been redefined. And now the civil liberties granted to us by the Constitution are being challenged. We allowed this to happen. We sat idly by in the previous elections and did not speak out, and the time for silence is gone. The media has shaped the mind. The unfortunate reality of media is that it's being controlled and manipulated by the opinions of its owners. The images and stories are designed to convince you of a prescribed worldview. And it's amazing how the big story isn't really the big story at all. The story that gets mentioned is for the purposes of keeping the status quo. The news is biased. And when we take that as our only form of feeding, we're on a diet that the media controls because we've stopped looking for ourselves the same way we've stopped reading the Bible. And we look to teachers like myself or pastors like Greg or other pastors to spoon feed. It's undignified. As a believer, it's undignified as an American. We become a nation, spoon-fed what the government wants you to hear. Our president will not allow law enforcement to look at the social media accounts of potential terrorists, but he wants to break encryption technology only after 14 were murdered. There's something wrong with that. The hands of our president are stained with the blood of those victims. Yet no one will speak out for fear of retribution. Censorship in America is at an all-time high. I fear censorship because I watched what happened to my people in Nazi Germany. My father came to this country to avoid this kind of persecution, this kind of censorship. Yet it's happening and people are being censored online for taking a stand. It should not be so. We decided in 1963 that prayer in school was unconstitutional. So we replaced prayer with tolerance acceptance, and even promotion of every religion, lifestyle, and sexual preference. The tragic shootings, drugs, and bullings that have taken place in schools are a byproduct of the worldview of our educational system, now legislated by our federal government, te telling us what we should teach our kids. We're in an election year. 
And many are asking questions about who can we trust to lead our nation. Let me first tell you it's clear who we cannot trust. We cannot trust special interests. We cannot trust career politicians. We cannot trust those who would challenge the very foundation on which this country was built. We cannot trust them. America's foundation is freedom. And on the air, I've said many times that America's framework is the Constitution. Our foundation and framework are solid, but the inner workings of government are corrupt. It's like remodeling a house. You don't tear the house down. You tear the interior out and you rebuild it. The foundation is good. The framework is good. The Constitution is good. But the contents are corrupt. The very same greed and avarice, immorality and idol worship that's brought judgment to the nations in the Bible are rampant within our borders. We've allowed this to happen. Listen, Americans are blessed by God to live in a free republic with a government structured upon democratic principles at multiple levels, including local, state, and federal government bodies. We're privileged to be able to vote, elect our government representatives as we elected Jim Carnes, and influence our decision makers and lawmakers. But are we doing that? Are we lending our voice? Are we writing the letters? Are we speaking out like this? Listen, all Americans agree or disagree on various public policies. Some lean this way, some lean that way. How? So we have to discern when government should be involved, and especially when the federal government should be involved. For Christians, believers, the ideal government would base its laws and policies upon God's laws. And fortunately for America, history teaches us that our founding fathers indeed structured our government upon sound biblical principles. However, we've strayed away from God's ideals as our government has evolved. We've moved so far to the point of catering to the needs of the minority that the majority don't get served. Let's examine the role of government, primarily the federal government, from a biblical and historical perspective. Consider the role of government as set forth in the Bible in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 2. I urge you then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is how we're supposed to live, and we're supposed to intercede and pray for our leaders. This passage not only says that as Christians, as believers, we're to be obligated to thank God for our leaders and to pray for them, but it also tells us what the role of government is. How many of you think government is out of control? How many of you think the federal government has insinuated themselves into every aspect of your life to the point they want to know what's on your telephone? It tells us what the role of government is. First and foremost, national defense. God created the institution of nations and determined that people would be divided according to national entities, with each controlled by its own independent government. England has its government, Canada has its government, Mexico has its government. We have borders in between. God condemned aggression from one nation against another. But knowing man's greed and evil, he sanctioned warfare as a means of protection against aggressors. We've been given this right to protect our borders against aggressors, but our borders have become open and our aggressors are now welcomed in. So herein lies the first and foremost responsibility and role of government, that of defense. And in our republic, this responsibility falls primarily on the federal government. That's part of their job, is to ensure the domestic tranquility, the national defense. Because our government was built on Christian principles, the historical documents penned by our forefathers, such as the Declaration of Independence, and the Constitution support the biblical guidelines 
for the role of government. Nothing contrary to it in our Constitution. The preamble to the Constitution states that the powers of gov the federal government are limited. Limited. Not expanded, but limited to one, ensuring the domestic tranquility, law and order. Two, providing for the common defense, national defense. Three, promoting the general welfare, supporting scriptural truth, supports the general welfare of the majority of Americans, securing the blessings of liberty, providing freedom, freedom to worship, freedom that I might be able to speak out without condemnation from the government and sanctioning my 501c3 status and putting it in jeopardy, that my nonprofit is put in jeopardy because I'm willing to speak out freely about this country that I love, that I, my family came to to be free. The Constitution is quite clear in setting forth its purpose of limiting the role of government. It doesn't simply present a list of things the federal government should do. Instead, it limits what the federal government can do. For example, in Article 1, Section 8, it says, the Congress shall have power to. And if it's not listed there, the Congress should not have power to do it. But yet we've expanded through executive order. We've expanded through committee. We've allowed the government to insinuate itself into things that the Constitution did not provide for them to do. And now our states and our local authorities no longer have the right to govern without the permission of the federal government. It's trying to do much more than it's supposed to do, according to both the Bible and the Constitution. As a result, federal government spending is out of control, regardless of its intention to help people. And certainly, I know the hearts of many in public service, the federal government should not be involved in most of its current spending activities. Just because someone, somewhere, will receive a benefit, this does not justify going forward with a program to be funded by tax increases. Yes, minorities have needs, but not to the jeopardy of the majority. And this was a majority rule country. This was a country founded on majority rule. And yet our voice has been silent whether by choice or by oppression or fear of censorship, our voice has been quieted and it must no longer be so. It's not the role of government to distribute or redistribute wealth. Unfortunately, some politicians have used promoting the general welfare as an excuse for empowering the federal government to do anything as long as it's intended to provide some good for any selected individual or group. But this goes to the needs of special interest and entitlements. This distorts the meaning of the word welfare. I believe that people should get a help in transition, but not to become dependent on the government, not to be incented to adopt children because you get extra money from the government. It's not the role of government to continually grow into an unmanageable and wasteful institution in the name of doing good for select individuals through undeserved entitlements at your expense and at my expense. In this respect, the role of government is being exceeded beyond what the Bible and the Constitution allow. In the last election, 51 million Christians did not vote. They claimed they didn't want a Mormon in the White House, yet they reelected a man whose mission it was and still is to allow the ideology of Islam and terrorism to enter our borders. This must never happen again. This must never happen again. Now you came here today because you wanted to hear some opinions about the current election year. I'll give you some opinions. We are not electing a pastor in chief. This nation has been led by Quakers. Baptists, Methodists, Episcopalians, Catholic, Unitarian, Presbyterian, and one of the most famous presidents of all, touted in history with a large monument in Washington, may not have even been a Christian at all, Abraham Lincoln. In all candor, as I look upon the candidates up on that platform, 
And I look at the ones who have led with their faith to say, oh, I'm an evangelical Christian. I'm involved in my church. I believe in biblical principles. I've seen their conduct unbecoming of a believer. I'm embarrassed for the name of Christ by the comments being made from that stage by those who have led with their faith. Lies, half-truth, and distortion are not biblical principles. Now, this summit is not about endorsing or even addressing specific platform differences. It's about empowering you to make your voice heard because your voice matters. If you do not vote in this upcoming election, America may never be able to recover. Four or eight more years of this progressive liberal agenda will strip you of every right you have, and the ideology of Islam will be rampant within our borders. Our nation is facing serious issues, and we have to discern who can lead us back to a healthy economy. Who will protect us from the enemies both inside and outside our borders? Who will take a stand against special interest and reduce the size of government? Who will stimulate jobs and restore our military strength? Who will stand up against Sharia and the agenda of Islam? Who will bring pride back to being an American? You know, I was born in 1952 and I was raised to answer the question, who am I? And my answer was always, as I was told as a child, you answer the fact you're an American. That's who you are. You're not a Jewish American. You're not a Hungarian American. You're an American. I want to elect someone who can defeat liberalism and progressive thought and take America back for Americans. Now, I keep hearing the word conservative banding it around. This one is conservative. This one's not. This one's a populist. This one's an ultra conservative. This one's a constitutional conservative. So I began to look up what, what is conservatism, and I'm going to give you a share with you a definition that I can get behind. Number one, men and nations are governed by moral laws, and those laws have their origin in a wisdom that's more than human. It is divine. Divine justice. A heart. At heart, political problems are moral and religious problems. The wise statements tries to statesman tries to apprehend the moral law and govern his conduct accordingly. We have a moral debt to our ancestors who bestowed upon us our civilization and a moral obligation to the generations who will come after us. This debt is ordained of God. We have no right, therefore, to tamper imprudently with human nature or with the delicate, delicate fabric of our social and civil order. God created man and women and the definition of marriage. God created levels of government to meet the needs of people. God himself created in the Bible this division of power, this division of, of labor, that each man should earn and work for himself. A man who does not work and earns his wages is not worth anything. Number two, variety and diversity are the characteristics of a high civilization. Uniformity and absolute equality are the death of all real vigor and freedom in existence. Making us all the same will destroy us. This is what happens in China. This is what's going on in Korea. This is what communism was all about, that everybody's the same. This is what socialism is about. Even in its origin in Israel that was founded on certain socialistic principles because England was at the founding of the new state of Israel, they began with a system called the kibbutz. And in that kibbutz, everybody shared equally no matter what your job was. And they found out that there were people that were not pulling their weight and they could be doing more, but they didn't do more but they still got their fair share. So they went to the Moshav, which was capitalism. Now you weren't forced to live where you weren't. You were no longer forced to share. You were paid based on your performance. If you wanted to live there, you could, but you paid for what you, you weren't entitled. And you know what happened? Productivity went up and all of a sudden they got competitive and all of a sudden they began to go after the world market. And now they grow more vegetables than they can possibly consume, and they're providing for Turkey and for Russia and for all of Europe. 
And some of your grocery stores here because the system works. The empowerment of people is to make ourselves better each and every day, that I should be better than I was yesterday. My country should be better than it was the day before. We cannot drive for uniformity in this country, otherwise we will squelch all creativity, all free enterprise. It's no wonder that Israel holds more patents per capita than any nation in the world. It's no wonder the two percent of the two tenths of one percent of the population of the world holds twenty percent of the Nobel prizes. It's disproportionate because we've been oppressed. It's disproportionate because we've been held down. Well, now we're fighters, and now we fight back, and we aspire to more than the last generation had, and to pass on to the next generation something even greater. And we do it not on the backs of others, but on the, our own backs, not on the backs of government and entitlement. And the conservative says, I want the opportunity to excel without the government controlling what I can excel at and how far I can go. I've left companies like Hewlett Packard, like AT&T, because they wanted to manage my income. Because they set a cap on how far I could go. That when I achieved those results, they cut me back, cut my commissions, cut my bonuses because they wanted to control my income. America is about freedom. And conservatism is about exercising that freedom without government control. This is about justice. Justice means that every man and every woman have the right to what is their own, to the things best suited to their own nature, to the rewards of their ability and integrity, to their property and to their personality. Civilized society requires that all men and women have equal rights before the law, but that equality should not extend to the equality of condition. The government should not manage uniform conditions. This is the agenda of Bernie Sanders, of Hillary Clinton, that all of a sudden everybody should work on a level playing field because we're all Americans and we should share equally. Society is a great partnership in which all have equal rights, but not equal rights to equal things. The just society requires sound leadership, different rewards for different abilities and a sense of respect and duty. And this is not the liberal agenda. This is the conservative agenda. Property and freedom are inseparably connected. Economic leveling is not economic process, progress. Conservatives value property for its own sake, of course, but they value it even more because without it, all men and women are at the mercy of an omnipotent government. Should the government be in the land management business or should the states? Who should have the rights to what belongs within our borders? Who should control these kind of things? Should it not be a reflection of the heart of the people as it was in the Bible that God appointed rulers based on the hearts of the people? In Alabama, our heart is different than California. We should have different types of leadership and different types of law. Power is full of danger. Therefore, the good state is one in which power is checked and balanced, restricted by sound constitution and customs. So far as possible, political power ought to be kept in the hands of private persons and local institutions. Centraliz centralization is ordinarily a sign of social decadence. Rome, decadent. The Greeks, decadent. And we look on those civilizations and say they gave us such great philosophers. Yeah, their philosophers said if it feels good, do it. If it serves you, embrace it. Should be no boundaries and laws for human behavior. If you want to have eight wives, have eight wives. As Hillary Clinton once said, what difference does it make? When we look to the civilizations, the Roman Empire no longer stands, does it? The Greek Empire no longer stands, does it? Because the moral decay brought about their destruction. And they were ruled by a head who had a strong arm, who drove compliance, and everybody was on a level like the caste system in India. There was no freedom of expression. There was an order, and the order was ruled with a heavy hand, and you were executed if you broke that order. America is moving towards that order if we don't stop it in its tracks. America is headed down a path of destruction because moral decay is being legislated 
Bill Clinton redefined sex in America, and I'm embarrassed for our nation because of it, because the standards have been so compromised. And now we're about to what? Allow him to go back into the White House and carry on the antics of his administration to promote the moral decay of America? People say that the number one killer in America is heart disease, and I tell you the number one killer in America is abortion. The number one cause of death in America is abortion. This was legislated by our government that had our best interest at heart. Let me tell you, the best interest of that unborn child is to be born. The best interest of America is to have a culture where life matters and the sanctity of life is preserved. And I don't need nine men in a courtroom to tell me what's right and wrong. God told me what was right and wrong. God established the boundaries. <laughs> Ronald Reagan said, a nation that's not under God will be a nation gone under. This administration has moved Jesus out and Muhammad in. This administration has made it so that pastors are fearful about speaking about these matters in the pulpit for, lot, for fear of being persecuted and having their 501c3 status removed. And you know what I say? Bring it. I say bring it. That's what people like Jay Seculo do for a living. Why first priority, praise at the schools. They may have to pray outside the school or in a room in the school before hours or after hours, but they've broken through that barrier. And let me tell you something, as long as there are tests in school, there'll be prayer. <laughs> before I knew anything about praying in school, when I got a test, I prayed. I don't know who I prayed to, but I prayed. The conservative believes that we need to guide ourselves by the moral traditions, the social experience, and the whole complex body of knowledge bequeathed to us by our ancestors. This is why it's so important what Michael has to say. What were our founding fathers thinking? What was the founding principle of this nation? And how far have we strayed from what the intent of our Constitution was like? And how dare we put officials into office that will not stand up for the Constitution that people gave their lives for? The conservative appeals beyond the rash of just the opinion of the hour. The considered opinions of the wise men and women who died before our time, the experience of the race is what must me, we, we must consider. Listen, we were not born yesterday. Our founding fathers were, and they left for us great lessons. They left for us great intelligence. And the wise man says, I don't have to go out in the world and make my own mistakes to learn. I can learn from the mistakes of those who came before me. And if I want to carry it out on the traditions of freedom and justice in the form of government that's going to bring me the opportunity to freely express my faith, I want somebody in that White House just like Michael said. I don't care what his faith is, but he better not care what mine is. And if our country is allowing enemies, stated enemies of me, a Jew, stated enemies of me, a Christian, I got them coming at me on both sides. They want to annihilate me here and they want to annihilate me there. And they're coming for you because you're defined as an infidel. And this administration has allowed our borders to be compromised and you are no longer protected. You're in danger. What happened in Oregon when that young man took a gun and went up to people and said, are you a Christian? And if they said they were a Christian, they were shot in the head. You know, the real hero was the second person who was willing, knowing that the first one was shot because he was a Christian, the second one who spoke out and said, yes, I am a Christian. That was the hero of Oregon. And the third and the fourth and the fifth and the ones that came behind that declared, yes, I'm willing to die for Christ. Because our founding fathers died in the War of Independence. Our soldiers died so you and I could be in a church without the police and the militia outside ready to take us out. 
How will we remember? We keep talking about how we remember Christ. How will we remember our forefathers? Those who went before us to prepare the way for our freedom. And what will we do to uphold what they gave their lives for? What will we do to break down government? To take back America for Americans? I'm reminded that the two dead people in San Bernardino, those two terrorists, they have no rights. Dead people have no rights. And why are we protecting the civil liberties of those that are not protected by the Constitution? Because they're not citizens of this country. And why are my citizens, why are my rights as a citizen being violated for the sake of a refugee from a country they didn't want to leave in the first place? How can we provide cell phones for Mexican immigrants, illegal aliens crossing the borders? stipend for them and we can't support our homeless veterans? This is the kind of programs that Washington has advanced, taking from you and I, and they get to determine who benefits it. You and I are responsible for acts of charity. You and I are responsible for ministering to those less fortunate. That is not the government's responsibility because the government has taken that responsibility. We've got a percentage of the population that doesn't feel they have to do it because they're no longer responsible. The federal government has taken their job. Federal government's taken the job of the local church, the local parish, the local synagogue. They've taken the job. They're feeding the hungry. They're doing it. But those who really hear the call of Jesus are the ones pressing in to taking care of the widows and orphans and not leaving it to the federal government. This is our call. Modern society truly needs community. And true community is a world away from collectivism. And collectivism is the agenda in Washington today and what they're trying to promote even further. Real community is governed by love and charity, not by compulsion. Through churches, voluntary associations, local governments, and a variety of institutions, conservatives strive to keep the community healthy. Where do the liberals go to church? Conservatives are not selfish, but public-spirited. They know collectivism means the end of real community, substituting uniformity for variety and force for willing cooperation. I'm not going to be like those in Washington. He made me, they did not. In the affairs of nations, the American conservative feels that his country ought to set an example to the world, but ought not try to remake the world in its image. You heard it on the stage many times, we're not the world's policemen. We're not to set the standard for the world, but the world cannot set the standard for us. I don't want to be like Rome. I don't want America to be like Iran. I want America to be like the America that I grew up in. It's a law of politics as well as biology that every living thing loves above all else, even above its own life. It's distinct identity which sets it off from other things. The conservative does not aspire to the domination of the world, nor does he relish the prospect of a world reduced to a single pattern of government and civilization. Who aspires to the one world government? Who aspires to the one world religion? It is that who sets himself up as God and not the God I serve. The one who wants to bring about destruction. And the more you read your Bible, the more you understand who the Antichrist is when you understand that an Antichrist spirit is now permeating in Washington. And the more they try to unify us and make us all think the same, talk the same, learn the same. Let me tell you something. I couldn't read until I was eight years old. I grew up in a home where there were seven languages spoken, and English is the most complex of them. English is the most complex, and I was forced to not learn any of the other six languages. I was forced to learn English while hearing Yiddish and Hungarian and Russian and Ukrainian, and German, in my ears, every single day. I finally had to learn by listening to records. Eight years old. Imagine under Common Core, I could have been a college graduate at eight years old and not be able to read. <laughs> Children learn differently. A common core drives for uniformity the same way Adolf Hitler drove for uniformity. I don't want to be like anybody else.
I want to be like him. And the government can't legislate that. And the government can't send me a textbook not even printed in America. I don't want my children and my grandchildren learning how to pray in Arabic. I don't ever remember seeing in any school in the last 64 years of my life where they taught Hebrew in the public school. Or you're to dress up like your, famous, your favorite Jewish character. But now they have kids dressing up in burqas. Muslim Celebration Day, Diversity Day. They've been around 1,400 years. We've been around 5,000 years. And they call us the new kid on the block. Men and women are not perfectible. Conservatives, no, and neither are political institutions. We cannot make a heaven on earth, though we certainly can make a hell. We're all creatures of mingled good and evil. And good institutions neglected and ancient moral principles ignored. The evil in us tends to predominate. And this is what's happened to Washington. Avarice, greed, power, authority, selling out, cutting the deal, worried about what you're going to make when you retire, where are you going to get your next speaking fee, what's your legacy going to be like is replaced representation. And these principles are being ignored. I'm suspicious of all utopian schemes. I'm suspicious of all. Free this for all and free that for all because there is no free lunch. There never has been. There never will be. And I have no, I've already paid for one child's education. And let me tell you, her two-year degree cost eight years. It's a lot of money. But now she's working two full-time jobs. At 27 years old, she makes $93,000 a year. And as she says, Daddy, I got big bank. Because she learned. She learned through the school of hard knocks. She learned to set her goals. She learned to aspire to something greater. Under this government we have now, that aspiration would be squashed. Her ability to perform at her highest level will be crushed by what? Tax rates that will penalize her for doing well because she applied herself, because she learned skills, she learned to do things, she makes jewelry, and she works for a jeweler, and then she's a project manager at night for a chemical company. She works two full-time jobs and has her own jewelry business. 27 years old, making $93,000 a year. She said, I don't want a mortgage. I said, good, baby. She said, I want to pay for it. I don't want a car payment. When I can afford to pay cash for a car, I'll buy myself a car. In the meantime, I'll drive this one. That's not the American way for the millennials. But she saw hard work ethic in both her grandparents and her parents. Children will follow the lead of what they see, not what they hear. And even she knows that it's BS being spewed across the airways. We're suspicious. I don't believe by power of positive law we can solve all the problems of humanity. We can hope to make our world taller, but we can't make it perfect. When progress is achieved, it's through prudent recognition of the limitations of human nature. I don't need government to tell me my limitations. I've got the Lord to show me and strengthen me and prepare me for the next. And this idea of leveling income and leveling lifestyle is not the government's responsibility. But we've allowed them to do that because it was easier and people became dependent. Change and reform, conservatives are convinced, are not identical. Moral and political innovation can be destructive as well as beneficial. And if, if innovation is undertaken in a spirit of presumption and enthusiasm, probably it'll be disastrous. 
You see, the more excited Barack Obama was, the more excited Hillary Clinton is, the more excited that Bernie Sanders is, the more suspicious I am that it's a path to disaster because they feed on the emotions. Work up the crowd. This has been the democratic way. Stir up a crowd. Give them a cause. Government is not a cause. Government is not a calling. Government has responsibilities, and our government is not performing the responsibilities they're charged with, but have insinuated themselves in so many areas that they have no business being in. American conservatives endeavor to reconcile the growth and alteration essential to our life with the strength of our social and moral traditions founded on biblical traditional values. The American family may have changed where it eats its meal, but the American family should be a mother, a father, imparting to their children and not allowing the schools to show them at 11 years old how to put on a condom. It's now at 11 years old. A child in school today needs a permission slip from you as a parent to get an aspirin, but they can't tell you that they're getting birth control pills. They need a permission slip in school to take a prescribed medicine that you've given to the school nurse to administer during the day, but they will help her get a morning after pill and not tell you about it at all. This is a gift from our federal government, thank you very much. No longer do parents have to have the talk with their children. As a matter of fact, parents are going to children to get their questions answered for themselves. Because our kids seem to know a whole lot more about it than we ever did. And what about all this bullying? Now we're gonna protect the rights of the bully. Isn't that what's happened in America? Look at these power situations where They've corrupted people. Who are our idols today? Lady Gaga? Who do people look up to? Politicians are a byword. Ronald Reagan was a hero. JFK in his own way was a hero. But when we look back on the presidents in my lifetime, there's very few that I can look at and have the utmost respect for. I still respect the office, but the man in the office has lost my respect. And we've allowed it to happen because we as believers are the ones responsible for being quiet. Oh, the Lord will provide. The Lord will take care of it. Well, you're going to hear a passage of Scripture that speaks right to that pretty soon. Conservatism, then, is not simply the concern of people who have much, much property and much influence. It's not simply the defense of privilege and status. Most conservatives are neither rich nor powerful. But they, even, but they do, even the most humble of them, derive great benefit from our established republic. It's a period in my life during the Carter administration when I lost everything. I owned a company called Tractor Trailer Parts of America. I made parts for trucks and trailers that rolled across America. But Interest rates went to 18%, and the federal excise tax on anything that traveled over our highways and burned fuel was so far out of control that the tariffs I had to pay were more than the profits I made. And so I lost the business. I lost my home. I was moved out onto a street corner. The sheriff came, moved everything I had. So me being the positive guy I was, I arranged the front lawn, and I put a table out there and a reclining chair and organized everything, had my magazines right there, and I propped myself up, and I had no idea what I was going to do. 
I was homeless for two years, 1980 to 1982. But I was the best homeless person you ever knew. Because <laughs> I had a friend that drove a limousine. And he said, hey, if you drive for this company, they give you the car to use. I said, great. So I went down there. I got a job driving a limousine. They gave me a beautiful, brand new Lincoln Continental town car. So I threw whatever possessions I had in the trunk. And he said, come on with me. And we went to the Peachtree Plaza. It was pretty new back then. It was pretty pretty amazing hotel. And he said, listen, let me introduce you around. So he introduced me to the front desk manager. He introduced me to the bell manager. And they said, okay, listen, <clears throat> after you've made your rounds from the airport and dropping people off, when you drop somebody off here, just pull the car over, leave it there. All right. And when you walk in, we'll tell you what room is vacant. And you can go in there and take a shower and take a nap. So I said, all right. So I always had clean clothes. Worked out a deal with the laundry there. Okay, I had two suits. I dropped one off, pick it up. All right. I don't know whose bill they put it on, but it really wasn't my concern. <laughs> and you know, you're probably as guilty as this as I am. You've ordered room service and you eat half of it. And you put the tray or you don't like the potato or whatever. All right, and I used to eat off of room service trays. And I had steak and I had lobster. I lived a pretty good life. Two years I lived like that. I slept in vacant hotel rooms. They didn't have the front desk security like they had. You'd slip somebody a tip and they'd let you in. If I walked by a room and it was being cleaned up, I could say to the housekeeper, listen, I'm just going to take a nap for a little while. Why don't you come back in a little while, put the do not disturb sign on there and lay down. I did that for two years. Never told my family what happened because I was ashamed and embarrassed. But the very man that put me in that position was a man named Bert Lance, Office of Management and Budget in the Carter Administration. He happened to be one of my regular fares in my limousine. And one day he said to me, what are you doing driving a limousine? And I told him what he did to me. And he listened to that story. And one day he and a man named Jake Butcher, who United American Bank, ran for governor of Tennessee, brought the world's fair to Tennessee. Probably still in jail. Maybe he's dead now. They told me to pull up to a building, and I thought they had a meeting there. It was Bell South headquarters. And they said, go in and ask for a woman named Zan Wright. And so I walked in and asked for Zan Wright, and she said, come on in. We're expecting you. And I said, okay, am I here to pick up a package? No, 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 you're here to fill out papers. I said, what kind of papers? Employment papers. Well, what do you mean? I've never applied for a job. Oh, it's been taken care of. You see, the two guys sitting in my limousine heard my story. And knew what had happened to me at the hands of Washington and helped me out. I went on to become a national sales manager with AT&T from the help of those that destroyed me that helped me get back on my feet. They didn't give me a handout. They didn't give me an entitlement. I didn't take an unemployment check. I didn't take a welfare check. As a matter of fact, I never disclosed that I was homeless to anyone. My family never knew. I was able to call them. Where did I call them from? Hotel rooms. Because all you had to do was dial nine and you could be connected wherever you want. So I'd call them all the time. Oh, how things going? Great, great, great. Driving around. Well, what kind of car are you driving? Oh, Lincoln Town Car. <laughs> well, you need anything? You need any money? No, I got a pocket full of money. I had no bank account, but I had a big wad of cash. And I drove that limousine. You see, the government didn't do anything for me. People in the government who heard my story... But they were compelled by guilt because they knew what they had done. They had destroyed the backbone of American free enterprise. It's an old line from Batman 1, when you dance with the devil, the devil doesn't change, you do. And America danced with the devil at that time, and we're dancing with the devil now, and we've got to take it back. Amen. We've got to take it back. We've got to take America back. We have liberty Equal protection of the laws, the rights to the fruits of our labor. We have a right to having a personality, a right to consolation and death. We have the right to live our lives without the government telling us how, where, when, and what we should do. Conservatism is not simply a defense of capitalism. Indeed, capitalism is a word coined by a famous Jewish man named Karl Marx. 
The true conservative does not defend private property in a free economy. We do, we do stoutly defend private property in a free economy, both for our own sake and because these are means to great ends. Those great ends are more than economic and more than political. They involve human dignity. You feel better when you own something. You feel better when you've paid your way through something. You feel better when you're not taking a handout from somebody. You feel better about yourself, and you feel better about your family when you're not dependent on the government, but you can depend on the God-given gifts that you have to go out and make a living, to go contribute to society to the best of your ability. It doesn't matter if you're a garbage man, be the best one. I remember a garbage man in my neighborhood. And as I used to drive out of the neighborhood, I noticed that in my rear view mirror, in my side view mirror, I could see every one of the trash cans was perfectly lined up in order. Every one of them, not one of them was even off an inch. And this man took pride. He said, when my children drive down the street, I want them to see that although dad's a trash man, look how nice this neighborhood looks because I did that. And if somebody missed a bag, he'd stop and clean it up because that was his neighborhood because he took pride in it. You know what? Their policy was you couldn't tip them, but this man got thousands of dollars in tips because nobody was ashamed. Their trash can wasn't falling over. It wasn't out of line. It wasn't busted up. He took pride in what he did, and he felt good about it because he, that was the job he got, and that's the job he was going to take pride in. A conservative drives for that, believes in that, and not just do whatever you have to do, but make a difference. America is in the clutches of despair. Moral fiber, the moral backbone of America has been destroyed. In my mind, these are the pressing issues we must address with our next president and congressional leaders. Here are the questions I want you to ask. Who can rebuild a strong economy and revitalize a nation suffering on so many levels? Who can rebuild the dollar? Who can break the back of special interests? Who can build a team that will bring change and protect our borders? Who can defeat the liberal candidate of the Democratic Party and begin the process of restoring traditional values to America? Who will rebuild our military and defense initiatives to make America safe again? And who will defend Israel against the enemies amassing on their borders and threatening her annihilation? There are no perfect candidates. We must secure the White House and not stop there. We need 60 Republican senators to put an end to the policies that the Obama White House has implemented. We need a majority of the House to break the back of cronyism and reverse the trend towards more government, more debt, more regulations, and more taxes. We need a strong foreign policy that protects America's interests and stops our enemies before they reach our borders. And most importantly, we need an America that stands immovable in defense of Israel. America needs change. Change that will restore the rights given to us by the Constitution. Change that will reduce the size of government and empower the local citizenry to decide what our children need to learn and how to best serve the needs of the individual community. We're in the South. We're not like the North or the West or the Far West. We see the redundancy and the waste of Washington. And we see career professionals. I'll remind you, the Titanic was built by professionals. The Ark was built by amateurs. You have an obligation and responsibility to vote, to not be silent, to tell Washington what it is you want, what you like and don't like, and to have people who stand for what you stand for, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. For the last seven years, the last seven years we've become a nation that has Curse the darkness, but refuse to light a candle. There's power of one. You plus God make a majority, and if we want to take America back, you have to get out and vote, and you have to be vocal in this next election. You have to put yourself behind a candidate. You have to make your wants, needs, and desires known. You need to get people to the polls. 
You need to get out and do something. And you are people of faith, otherwise you wouldn't be gathered here. But James wrote this and said it best. Faith without works is death. It's not just the works of the Lord, it's the works of the government, the works of the community, the works to bring about the general welfare, because you are a part of that. And I'm not talking about welfare, I'm talking about the well-being of every American. And we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to do our part. I have the responsibility to stand up to say these things to you, to let you know that America is heading on a path of destruction, and it's up to us. The strength of America is our resolve, our passion, and our faith. And we must commit and pass the message on to everyone in our family, our workplace, our sphere of influence, that we must never be silent again. Thank you.